Boy, I like that verse there that we just sang about why I shouted out about uh, defeating our enemies and all that. And it's going to be done through the mighty power of God's word. Open your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19, and we'll be reading uh, verse 20, verse 20, Acts chapter 19, one verse, and uh, we're going to build on this. So it's just called a, a textual version uh, a sermon instead of a expository sermon, and uh, we'll get back to expository preaching later on. But I wanted to share a few things about uh, this verse, and out of this verse has come a lot of things. And and since I've had uh, a lot of time off uh, here lately, I've uh, been able to go over and over and over again. And bless Miss Shirley's heart. I don't know how many slides she has for you for the next couple of three weeks, but God's just laying scripture upon scripture upon scripture upon this one scripture. And I'm excited about sharing with you this morning, verse, chapter 19 and verse 20 of the book of Acts says, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed, mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Do you know what? The gates of hell cannot prevail. Amen. And it's because of those who have God's word in their life. Those who, who, uh, who know how to use the sword mightily prevail the word of God. And so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Based on that scripture, I'd like to go and share just how powerful and how mighty the God, word of God is. And ever since the fall of man, people have been in rebellion against God. And uh, if, uh, Psalm chapter 2 said, is, is what they say. said, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And when they said, you know, we're not going to be, we're not going to be connected. We're not going to be slave. We're not going to be uh, under the power of anyone. We're going to live our own life. It's like man today who says no to God. You know, the scripture says the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And I say on top of that is very foolish to say no, God. Amen. To say no to God. And so they say, we're going to be free from all that. And the scripture continues in saying, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Why? Why is he going to laugh? Because they imagine themselves to be free, but in reality, they become more enslaved than ever before when they reject God in his ways. John chapter 8 and verse 34 says, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant or is the slave of sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, And you hath he quickened, that means you were dead in your sins and trespasses, and he has quickened you. Quickened there means brought to life. That's called eternal life, okay? And you hath he quickened who were dead, in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The spirit that now worketh, that does, who's working on you, okay? Who's working on you. God's working on you too. In fact, God said, the scripture says, God is God which worketh in you. Both to, but this, uh, Satan, our enemy, works on you. Amen? He works on you. And uh, so uh, he, Satan is a manipulator. First thing I want to share with you about Satan is that he, Satan manipulates fallen men by two men. He works on him. And he used two different ways to go about doing that work. First of all, Satan influences uh, the lost people. The fallen person influences the mind. Influences the mind to get you to start thinking in the wrong direction, in rent, thinking in his direction. They have the mind of him instead of the mind of Christ. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 reads, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Why? Because, or for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. One of the things that disturbs my heart and develops to a point of being having a broken heart is when I present the truth of the love of God and all of what God, who God is and all of what God has done 
for us so that we could be together with him. And I share that. And there are those who just ignore or even mock that. You know why? Because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. Has blinded their eyes. Um, so they can't know it because they are spiritually discerned. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 it says, In whom the God, little g, of this world blindeth the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. It says, in whom the God of this world blinded the what? Not the eyes, blinded the minds of them which believe. So one of the first ways that our enemy, Satan, wants to manipulate you is through your brain, okay? Through your thinking and to blind you to the things of uh, of God, which will bring light. He wants to keep you in the dark uh, about those things. Um, so, in an effort to destroy these wrong ideas, these false or wrong philosophies, these proud philosophies, like Satan himself said, I will be as the most high. That means what? God's not over me. I will do. I, I'm going to become my own God, which means this. I'm one who decides what's right and wrong. And he's tempted Adam and Eve in the same way in Genesis chapter 3. He says, hey, God, God knows that when you, know, when you do it, uh, to eat of these fruit, you shall be as God's knowing, discerning, and knowing uh, right from wrong, or discerning good from evil. In other words, you can be God, and you're the one now who's calling the shot what's right and what's wrong. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the trap uh, that unregenerated or lost people have in their mind, is that, well, I don't think it's wrong. I know that's what God says, but I, th I don't think that's wrong, or I think this is right. And there's a way that seems right in man's eyes, but the end of other ways of death, because they're not the ways of truth, which is God's word. And so Satan wants to blind the mind, to keep you in, the blind means darkness, to keep your mind in the dark, lest the light of God's word comes and opens it up. And you say, oh, I see the light. I see the way. And Christ said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Satan wants that to be dark in people's eyes. Say, no, no, you can do it your way. And all that, because that's what he did. And he got, got kicked out of heaven for that. Amen. So, you know, saying, well, I, I can decide what's right and wrong, or I don't see what's wrong. I don't need this. I don't need the Bible. Why? Because the Bible's going to tell me I'm wrong. Amen? Amen. If the Bible's true, would you have to change your life? Uh-huh. It is true, so change your life. All right? Simple as that. Well, uh, in an effort to destroy these ideas and these false or proud philosophies, uh, these thoughts, um, these uh, human ideologies, uh, we've, we've got to war. We've got to go to war about that. And we must war to bring every thought captive to Christ. Not our thoughts been captive, captivated by our enemy, Satan, but we must go to war to be, bring every thought, not to ourselves, but on the other swing of the pendulum, to the thoughts to be captivated into the obedience of what Christ has say, rather than what the flesh in the world and Satan has to say. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 says, For though we walk in the flesh... You know, we're, we're, you know, we have flesh bodies and we walk in the flesh. But when we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but what? Mighty. Mighty. We're back to our verse. So mightily grew the word of God prevailed. The title of the message this morning, the mighty power of God's word. And here in this verse, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we're talking about the, the thoughts here, the mind, to bring every thought into the obedience of Jesus Christ. Mighty is our weapons. Mighty is our weapons. In John, 1 John chapter 2, verses 14, and the second part of verse 14 says, I've written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have 
overcome the wicked one. Why? Because of the mighty power of God's word in you, it overcomes the wicked one. When Christ was tempted uh, after his baptism in the wilderness, he was tempted in three years of lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and, and the pride of life. And in, in, in each instance that he was tempted and tested by Satan, he said, It is written. It is written. It is written. Amen? Why? Because he's the word in the flesh, but then he now totally identifies himself with man in his baptism. Now he does what man has to do, and he goes to the written word of God. The written word of God. That's what we have right now. And, and, and this mighty, a powerful word of God in our life to overcome the wicked one. So Satan manipulates fallen man by two means. The first one, as we saw, is from he influences the mind. The second way is that he influences the will. He influences the will. We're made, we're, we're, we're made up of spirit, soul, and body. Our soul is made up, we're made up of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Our soul is made up of three parts. Our mind, our thinking, our mind, our emotions, and our will. So if Satan gets us to thinking wrong, it will create our emotions to be able to do the wrong decisions and our will will be not in the will of God. And so we start getting the right things, the word of God in our hearts and lives. It's going to affect our emotions. You're going to fall in love with God even more to where your desire is his will, not your will anymore. Look at that in just a minute here, okay? But uh, uh, Satan influenced their will. Now, Satan cannot force his will on us. He cannot force our will. You cannot say, as the, uh, Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Uh, he is a defe he's defeated, folks. All right? He was defeated long, long time ago when Christ died on the cross for us. Satan was defeated. And now he, all he's is a big liar. All he can do is to try to convince you with lies to think that he's still powerful. He's not. He is not. Okay? So we had to spend an awful lot of time with him. We need to spend an awful lot of time with God's word. Why? Because it's mighty to the pulling down of strongholds and to bring in every thought obedient to the Jesus Christ. So Satan tries to influence the will. He does. How does he do that? He does so by a thing called temptation. All right? He just uses temptation. He cannot force your will. But he sure lays a lot of temptation. Anybody this week be tempted? Amen. Anybody here tempted not to raise your hand? All right. All right. Uh, but anyway, he, he does so by temptation. But he does that both externally and internally. He does so externally through the evil world system of which we live in. And internally through the sinful nature. The sinful nature of man. So he, he will tempt you through uh, the, the world in which we live in, this corrupted world which we live in, saying, you know, you've got to live this way to be drawn and, can, and conformed to the world and the world's ways. And tempting you doing that, or also tempting you because of the things that, you know, you have in your life that uh, you also want to, uh, the, you know, the lust of the eyes and lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Pride, pride of life. And he uses those sayings, but he cannot force those sayings on you. Why? Because he is defeated, amen, by the word of God, which became flesh. Satan, Jesus Christ, the word defeated Satan. Now, in John chapter 8, and the first part of verse 44 says, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. And so what he lusts, he knows, he knows what he lusts, he knows what you lust, and he'll use those temptations, whether through the earth, uh, the worldly system, or through our own sinful nature, because we're still in the flesh, all right? Someday, Christians, we're going to be out of this flesh, amen? We're going to be out of the presence of sin, out of it. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, How? By the renewing of your mind. How can you renew your mind? It can only be done through the washing of God's word. Uh, yes, brain washed. Yes. You say, well, I don't want to be brainwashed. Well, then why, no wonder you have such a filthy mind. 
Amen. We need to clean, uh, we need God's word, clean our act up. Amen. The washing of the word, the purifying of God's word by the renewing of your mind. Why? That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Those all describes one will of God, not, not three different stages of God's will. No, it all describes one. But reason being because of the word prove. When you look at the word prove there, it means to, to put to test, to research, to, to uh, investigate and all that. And let me tell you something. The greatest thing, to, possession that you can have to be able to discern the will of God is a renewed mind. Because here's a renewed mind, and, and so uh, let's say, uh, because of the renewed mind from the Word of God, then you find yourself um, being temperate, whereas before you weren't, okay? And so those whose minds are renewed in temperance, they're not going to have any problem then relating to the temperance that God tells us to have, the will of God. Uh, when our heart, our mind has been renewed uh, about uh, sinning in some way, then we're going to understand more clearer uh, what the will of God is toward that sin. If our heart is not renewed, then we're going to reject whatever is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. And that's why you see people there are two different types of people, those who say yes to God and those who say no to God. Why? Because of the, mi the mind or the heart of man that's involved there. So we see that Satan he manipulates fallen men by two means, for a, through the mind and trying to then through influences through our will. So folks, let me tell you, this is why Christ came. This is why Christ came. He knows that Satan wants to influence your mind. He wants to influence your will. He wants to manipulate the, the spirit that worketh on you, okay? Worketh on you. John chapter 1 and verse 14. This is why Christ came. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. You know, and the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And so in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, word was God and the word became flesh. That's where we know the capital W on that word means it's the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, and he is the word that came and become flesh. And 1 John chapter three and verse eight tells us also, <clears throat> he that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, here's why Christ came. For this purpose, the Son of God, the Word, was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> What's another word for the Son of God? Well, another word is what? The Word, all right? What or who and what destroys the work of the devil? The Word of God, who he is and what? what we have now, the Word of God. He, we say, well, I don't, any, I don't have any problem with, with Christ destroying the devil. I'm just struggling myself. That's why Christ left His Word. Amen? It's a word, and you, know, you shall know the truth, and truth, truth shall set you free, make you free, right? And so, what keeps us in bondage? Not having the Word. Now, I haven't saying, well, I think I can handle it on my own. I think I can do it my way. I, I've got my opinions and all that. And who first said that? Did that come from Jesus Christ? No, those thoughts need to be brought captive to Jesus, uh, captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so it says, uh, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God, the Word, was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise, likewise took part of the same. In other words, he came, became flesh. He became human for us. Why? That through death he might what? Destroy. Amen? Amen. Destroy. Hey, we're talking about the power, the mighty power of God's word, not only becoming flesh, but mighty power of God's word that we can use today. Very important in our life. Might destroy him that hath power of death, that is the devil. Colossians chapter 2 in verse 15 says, And having spoiled principalities and power, he made a show 
of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let me tell you, folks, let me tell you this, why Christ came is to destroy and triumph over the works of the devil. Amen. And so I'm glad he did that, but I'm still struggling. He said, no, I've left you with something. A holy, inspired, spirit, a spirit inspired word of God. You want more of Jesus and more of the power of, God, of Jesus Christ? You've got to be in the book. You've got to be, and it's got to be applied to your life. And it's got to be the right book. Amen? Fill in the blanks. Number two, Satan will not be permitted to tarnish the earthly kingdom of Christ, of Jesus. Satan will not be permitted to tarnish. Well, I said, well, you know nothing to do about it. He's such a powerful thing. He's such a powerful spirit and all that. Oh, no, he isn't. He's defeated, remember? Why Christ came. Christ is gone. The work was done. He came to defeat, he and he defeated. Amen? That work is done. Remember that. He is defeated enemy in, our, in this world. So turn with, if you would, to the book of the Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. And we'll read the first three verses, if you would. Revelation 20, verse 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And they laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. Now all three, all those are the same, the same guy, okay? And bound him a thousand years. He's not going to be permitted to tarnish the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So he's not going to be allowed at all to tarnish in any way, shape, or form the earthly millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at the end of that millennial kingdom, he, Satan, and all his wicked forces, angelic and human. Do you realize that God calls some humans wicked? Wicked. And some of the things which they do, he's called wicked. And they are in the same category as Satan and his demons. And God calls them wicked. And he says, well, I'm not a wicked person. C compare yourself to God. Compare yourself to the holiness of God. And you'll find we're so wicked. And when those of us who have realized how wicked we were, and we realized we're lost and undone without the Lord Jesus Christ, and we humbled ourselves before him, and we called upon the name of the Lord to save us because we couldn't save ourselves. In all of our wickedness, we did not deserve to spend eternity with the holy, righteous God. And Jesus stepped in in our place and he gave us a robe of white of his, his righteousness. And God looks at us with the righteousness of Christ, not ours. Amen. And because of him, I'm going to worship him forever and ever and ever. Amen. But at the end of that millennial kingdom, Satan, his wicked angelic forces and humans that follow after him will be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. Look at verse 10, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And the devil that deceived him, so that's all he does, okay? He's a liar. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever he is defeated and i saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and i saw the dead now realize that when you're saved you've been translated from death to what to life, okay? So you are in the book of life. If you have not been translated, you are eternally dead. Not only are you dead in your trespasses and sin, not only are you dead physically, but you're dead spiritually. And that's who we're speaking about here, the dead that came. Now, a lot of people misinterpret that, think, well, when you die, you know, the, those who are saved and not will stand before this great white throne. No, Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
not before the great wrath. So get that straight who we're talking about here. It says, and I saw, the verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the great, I believe one of those books is the black box, like, like, like in an airplane, and it's called your conscience. Either excusing or accusing you. Okay, it's one of the things that's going to be used at the very end. But anyway, and the sea uh, gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Not only was, now guess where you get to go? You get to go with same, uh, Satan and all his demons. That's hell. But as I've said hundreds of times, the, I believe the worst thing about hell is not the fire, not the brimstone, not the worms, I believe the worst thing of hell is that people are going there right this very instant to spend eternity in the hell with their sins paid for. Christ paid for everybody's sin. And they didn't accept it because they would not have this man rule over us. And in hell, they're going, I'm here with my sins paid for, but I never received that free gift. I never accepted him as my Savior. Oh, to me, that's the most torturous thing that could ever be throughout all of eternity, knowing that I'm here with my sins paid for. I can't get over it. I say it, I, I've mentioned that so many times. I just can't get over that. From the very outset... Christ exercised absolute power and authority over Satan and his demons from the very outset. Now, it is, it's interesting. While, uh, while some men or some people um, through, down through the centuries have doubted Jesus and his identity, who he truly is, there's never, ever been a problem with the demons, who he was. Ever. His identity, never, in fact, James chapter 2, verse 9 says, Thou believest in God, excuse me, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. It's good to believe in God. In fact, you first must believe that he is, and there's more than that, that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you believe that there is one God, you do well. But remember this, the devils also believe and tremble. As I shared yesterday in, in an in evangelistic message at the memorial service, that, you know, you say, God said, why should I allow you into my heaven? You say, well, I, I believe in you. I, I believe in God. I, I don't have any problem. Don't, don't bother me with, with the gospel. I believe in God. Well, yes. But uh, you think you get to go to heaven because you believe in God? Yes. Uh, how about the devil? Is the devil going to heaven? No. Does he believe in God? Yes. Not only does he believe, but the scripture says he trembles. Why? Because he's defeated. He's defeated. He trembles. Christ has absolutely, absolute control over them. Absolute control. Absolute control. He had control for them to come out of people. Come out of people. And he says, and when you do so, shut up. Don't say a thing. Don't speak. Absolute control. Here's a verse in Mark chapter 1 and uh, verse 34. And cast out, it, go, it goes on to say, and, and cast out many devils and suffered, them not, suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. They knew him. He had the power to tell, to show his power over the demons, to, to cast them into pigs. Amen. What a degrading thing for them. Cast them into to the pigs and uh, to show his power. Remember Mark chapter 5, the first 13 verses talk about the gathering demoniac and all that, and, and there's a legion of, of demons in this man, and he cast him out into the pigs, and the pigs went crazy because of it, ran off the cliff and drowned in the sea and all that. Who had the power to do that? Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? The Word of God that was with God and is God. The mighty power of the Word of God. The power that came out of the Word of God as He spoke, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power in His Word that we had that we can speak His Word also. The power got absolute control from the very beginning. Listen, folks, demons are terrified of Christ. 
absolutely terrified. They're aware of their fate. They know that their, their time is coming. In fact, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 34, it says, the, the, the demons say it, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And you know, have they come to destroy us? Why? Because the mighty power of God, the gates of hell cannot prevail, cannot prevail. In our verse this, this morning, it talks, uh, it talks about, um, so mighty grew the word of God and prevailed, prevailed, prevailed means to overpower, overcome, win, conquer all the time, destroy. And this is, did you come to destroy us? They know their fate. They know their fate. Some of us, this is their time yet. Let me tell you about the weapon. The weapon that Christians are to wield in our personal battle with the forces of darkness, what's that weapon? It's the sword of the Spirit, which is, by the way, the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, and you know, taking the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what, that's, that's, that's the offensive weapon. Now, there's another weapon that goes along with, with that. Right after that verse, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication for all saints and for us that we have boldness to preach. So we're looking at the word of God, the power of God's word. But at the same time, we're going to have another, another message on also the power of prayer. Because those two go together, the word of God and prayer. Is it the word of God uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and praying always with all prayer and supplications. There's two offensive weapons there, not just one. Powerful, powerful things. Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 says, but we give ourselves, and the, 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 the apostle said that, that, you know, hey, we take care of the widows, do all these other things, and here's what we're going to do. We, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. All right? This is, you know, what, what's more important, what's the most important is the prayer and the word of God. Why? Because it's mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. It's mighty and destructive and conquering of the enemy. Acts chapter 19 and verse 20. That's our verse today. So mightily grew the word of God and what? And prevailed and prevailed. They were seen at that time, okay, the, the Word of God grew mightily, okay, uh, let me turn back over there. Uh, the, the Word of God grew mightily, uh, and so mightily grew the Word of God. So we say, oh, okay, more, more, more uh, are people hearing it and understanding it, and uh, the Word of God is having an effect in people's lives, people are getting saved and all that. But we forget sometimes to, about the last part of that verse says, and prevailed. That means this, that even then, as it was being written as it was being applied to their life it was growing they were growing spiritually and all that but they were using the word of god because the word of god prevailed what over the enemies they kind of snatched the light away the, the judaizers that were coming in snatched all those things that we've been studying about for these last this last year in the book of acts you know and that word of god it grew mighty but it prevailed and it does today Think about it. It's not just a verse for those back there, you know, in those days. Same Word of God. Same Holy Spirit. Same power. Christians are, I know what it means to be anemic, but Christians are anemic when it comes to the Word of God. Christ said, when I come again, will I find faith on this world? Faith cometh by what? And hearing by the word of God. And he said, well, I find faith. You know, that means this, there's going to be a famine. The scripture says there's going to be a famine of hearing the word of God. If you're, there's a famine of hearing it, there's definitely going to be a famine of putting it to work. In other words, you've taken the sword of the spirit, put it in a sheaf and put it up on, on, on the bookshelf. Christians, the point I'm trying to make today that God's laid on my heart so strongly as a pastor is this, we have got to be in the word. Not just come and, and hear a preacher preach or go to a, a Sunday morning Bible study and, and hear, hear it taught. We have got to be in it every day of our life. Large, huge, 
uh, sections of Scripture. A lot of Christians only have five minutes or five verses. You know, about five verses a day, and that's about it. And no wonder we're weak and anemic. We need a transfusion. We need a renewing of our mind so we can prove, put to test, discern, understand, and work along with the will of God. The good, acceptable, perfect will of God. We must be in the mighty power of God's word daily. Let me leave you this morning with this verse. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. What a promise from God. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, and that thou mayest observe to do, as James says, don't be a hearer, only be a doer, to do according to all that is written therein. For then, that's when, then and only then, Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Then, I have a message I wrote as a very young preacher on the subject of then, and looked at the scriptures about then. There's a lot of things that's got to be put in place in our life before the then happens. You want to be prosperous and successful in the way of your life, not just getting stuff, but you know, having a, a prosperous life doesn't mean having a bunch of junk. It means that having a rich, full, glorious life. Okay? Not, not talk about the stuff. And to be successful, then not just to have a bunch of stuff. Those things may be included there, but the main thing is talked about being successful as a Christian, as a child of God, and all that. You know, folks, it will not be done apart from the mighty power of God's Word. Bow your heads with me, please. Maybe this morning. Maybe this morning, God has spoke to your heart and says, you know what? You haven't allowed me to speak to you in a long time. When you speak to me, it's, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you? You don't spend time praising me, adoring me, loving me. You don't read my word. You feel as the enemy has put in your mind that all you need is a little bit of God each week in your life. And it's okay. As long as you go to church, go to church, or maybe all church services during the week, or maybe just one, that that's enough. You're not into your word, you fall in love with God, that provokes you unto good works and good deeds. And you'll find yourself there as a Christian today saying, man, my God has done so much for me and I have not paid much attention to him. Pastor Rick preached here a while back on to how, when's the last time you told God you loved him? What a powerful message. But when's the last time you paid attention to him? what he has to say to you. And you wonder why you're struggling in your Christian life. You may be here this morning without Jesus Christ as your Savior. You, if you, you would be catechized with God as a wicked. When you say, oh, I'm not wicked. Anybody that is not for God is against him. Christ said so. If you're not for me, you're against me. And you've realized that. And God says, I love you. Let me share some things with you. I love you so much that I gave my only begotten son to die on the cross for you, to pay for your, 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 your payment for sin, your penalty. And not only that, to give you eternal life, to give you life, to bring you out of darkness into light, out of death into life. I've offered that to you today, but you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ in, what, in the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God became flesh, and he gave his life for you. You need to give your life for him. Receive him as your Lord, not only your Savior, but as the Lord of your life. And be willing to repent and turn from your old life. And turn to him. It gives you what real life is all about. Not the lie of the devil. May that be done today in your hearts. Father, I pray that we respond to your word today in humbleness. And you told us that if we humble ourselves, you'll give us grace. You resist the proud, but give grace to the humble. 
May that be done today and you receive honor and glory of changing our lives, even as Christians, changing our lives and empowering our lives against this world system and Satan who lies to us. And I pray that in Christ Jesus' name, amen.